Good morning. My name is Karen Shivers. I am the UKC Program Manager for Nose Work, Rally, and Obedience. And I'd like to welcome you to this session on Nose Work. I'm going to go over some key points of the program and then open the session up to questions and answers. My moderator, Harriet, who's a club and judge coordinator here at UKC, will be helping us along the way. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Good morning from British Columbia. All right. Awesome. <laughs> um, here are some of the major changes in this program. And we're talking about this program was released in um, this year in 2020. Uh, I want to tell you first a little bit of history about this program. It was specifically written for UKC. And the program was given to them um, after two years of testing through United Nose Work. And uh, we did a major role revision with the assistance of United Nose Work. And then the new program, which we're working in now, was released January 2020. So one of the major things was that Hind Trial was eliminated. Uh, it was getting, um, it wasn't really a fair deal for the dogs that were competing in it. And there was so many Hind Trials that um, we wanted to just eliminate that particular uh, award. So now there's a limit. You can enter just about anything you want now. So once you have your title in the level, you can enter pretty much anywhere you want to enter. So elite dogs can go back and get level champions now, or as you're going on, which will start now. So as new dogs come in, they can go ahead and do their, their levels um, novice through all four elements, and then they can work for a level championship, and then they can move on. Or for dogs that go all the way up to elite first, they can come back and do their level champions as they go. And they can enter all of those at the same trial. So if I have an elite dog, I can go to, go to a trial that's, let's say, containers. And I can enter that dog in novice B, container, uh, novice B containers, advanced B containers, superior B containers, master B containers, and elite B containers for my championship at the same trial. So we've opened it up to allow people to um, to be able to enter and and achieve their titles in a in a faster manner, as well as having a lot of fun for the day. Um, so to do that, we made a, a nose work calculator. Actually, a good friend of mine made the nose work calculator for us. Uh, as judges have an eight hour limit, we're not limited to the number of dogs anymore. We're limited to times, and so we specified how much time it would take to do each element. And we built that into the calculator. And so all clubs have to do is put their numbers in the calculator as they go. And the calculator basically tells you if you're close to your entries or you, you're allowed um, X amount of more room before that eight hour limit is. And it's, it's free and available on the website for download. So y'all can go and play with it if you'd like to. The other things we changed are specifics on scent receptacles and how you prepare odors. Okay, and so now it's specific. So in the rules, it talks about using a pipette and one drop or two drops. So you guys, it's not something that you have to do. It's something that we gave you as something to use. We're not saying that you have to use that pipette and that you have to use that dropper. That's not it. We gave you um, the amounts that should be on there and a, a way to get them. Okay. Some people use an eyedropper. Some people use that. We're okay with that. We just gave you a suggestion. One of the other major things we did is limit the amount of hides in a location for interior and exterior searches. Um, I visited a club once and found that there was like 50 items out there for a master level search. And I was kind of freaking out about that. <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, we decided to limit those items, and those are also in the rule book or if you have questions about them. So, for instance, novice now is limited to in both interior and exterior. In a novice area, which is in interior, just 10 by 10, exterior 10 by 10, no less than eight and no more than 12 items can be in that search area. So we one of the major questions that have come up with that is, well, what if it's a bookcase? Well, that's one item. That's counted as one item. A desk would be counted as one item. Even though there's multiple places to hide something, that desk would be counted as one item. Um, and all our distractions have to be hidden. So none of the distractions can be out in the open for the dog to grab or get. They need to be hidden. So that includes on vehicles. Um, 
because otherwise the handler would know that it was a distraction, right? And so if they they wouldn't call that then, so it wouldn't be any it wouldn't be any difficulty for the dog and handler because they would understand well that's a distraction. I'm not going to call that. So that's the reason they are hidden. Okay. We also defined our search times and element times, and we reduced the amount of time that we could do it. We've studied the program since 2005 and took averages of how much time, and we found out what the average time for dogs was to find particular things in each level. So that's where those numbers came in at when you see the, <clears throat> the element times on page 20, I believe they're on. That, that's why they're there now, because uh, it's three minutes pretty much for all containers. It's three minutes across the board as well as handler discrimination. So, and you get more time as you go up and along to the higher levels. We also had um, some issues with the vehicle heights. So the new level for elite is five feet. However, um, people were concerned about that level on vehicles. And so we, we decided to make some exceptions for vehicles that all hides on regular vehicles, your personal car, your personal truck, a van, um, anything that's a regular passenger type vehicle that has a really nice paint job on it, no more than three feet. So none of those hides can be higher than three feet. So you, there shouldn't be a reason for dogs to be jumping all over vehicles that way. Um, anything other than that. So anything other than a vehicle. So let's say a horse trailer, um, a, uh, a, a boat and trailer, um, a four wheeler, uh, anything like that, uh, the regular five foot level golf carts would, would apply. So anything that we're um, not as concerned with the paint job or like farm equipment that won't hurt that dog to go up there, even if they don't scratch the vehicle. Another question that's come up a lot is, well, what if my dog doesn't, doesn't have an aggressive alert and he doesn't scratch? then the dog does not require to wear anything on his feet. So that's another, I'll get into that since we're in the vehicle hide height. A lot of people were concerned when that went out. The dog is not required to wear booties or socks on his feet if he doesn't pound, you know, pound on the vehicle or he doesn't rush up and go. So like high drive energy dogs will jump up on vehicles and they'll jump down really fast and a lot of times they'll scratch the vehicle not not meaning to and not having an aggressive alert but they'll scratch them uh, and we don't want that so if your dog has a tendency to do that just teach them to wear a booties or socks and you won't have that problem um, if the dog just goes to the vehicle and puts his feet up on it like this and smells we're not talking about that kind of dog okay we're not talking that that dog has to wear socks that dog isn't going to hurt a vehicle it's not going to scratch it the other thing that is really really good to do is to keep their nails short, especially when you're doing vehicle trials. So, for instance, all of our dogs here, especially the detection, the regular canine detection dogs that we have that we go out um, and do narcotics detection with, their nails are back to their feet. So, you know, they're they're like Doberman show dog nails. How about that? That's a good example to tell you about. That's what their nails look like. So they're not, there's no way they're going to scratch it. Yeah, Tiffany's funny. Um, there's no way they're going to scratch a vehicle like that. They can't do it. Okay, because if I'm out on a on a search and they do that, I don't want to pay for that person's paint job, especially if I don't find any dope. Okay, <laughs> so and and we don't want people we want people to to volunteer their vehicles for searches because it takes a lot of vehicles for these trials. And so if we've found a way to guarantee their vehicle is not going to get harmed, then they're going to be more open to letting us use it uh, for the required amount of vehicles. The other thing that we changed is um, calling alerts and the way they have to be or don't have to be on the entry form. So none of the dogs have to have a formal or uh, a regular alert where they say, oh, my dog sits in, in the majority of the levels. Okay, there are some exceptions, which we'll get into. They don't have to be formal, but the behavior has to be recognized to the official. And we have to know that the dog is communicating that there's been a decision made from that dog that says, hey, it's here, okay? If you have a dog that's just going meandering around and he kind of does a little look back like this and he goes on, that's not really a, a behavior that we're looking for. That is a change in behavior, but that's not something that <clears throat> is a formal, rec I mean, recognized behavior that a, an official could do. Now, in the novice level, if you call that, it's probably going to be okay. 
But as you get higher in the advanced levels, you're going to find that it's very difficult for a dog like that. And we've learned as we've gone through the program that I know that there's a lot of, I just let my dog do his natural thing. <clears throat> and in some instances that works, but the majority of dogs at the higher level, they get it, but the handler doesn't get it. So what happens is you start second guessing, reading your dog, like, was that the behavior that he normally gives me? Uh, was that what he's supposed to be doing? Uh, uh Oh, and then you don't call it. And the dog says, Hey, I just gave you my behavior. Look, I wagged my tail. You missed it. I wagged my tail. And then they get a little, things kind of go south from there. So that's why we tell you that it's, it's better if you're going to do this program and go all the way through it, especially get into championships and grants to have some kind of a formal and recognized alert behavior. Not saying that you have to do it. I'm just saying that you're going to be, it's going to be much easier and you're going to be much happier. And so is your dog as you go on into the higher levels and, and want to get into this program and, and do it like it is built to do. Okay. So you have to call the alert. That's all there is to it. The judge and, and people forget in the school, I did a lot of judging and I sometimes would say, like helping them out because they'd forget and they go, oh, oh, alert. Okay. So you have to call it. So that's, and it's okay. Most of the judges, our judges are really good about it and they'll help you out if you forget. So it's all right. Um, but you do have to call the alert. Um, we don't require that you call a, um, a clear. Okay. So there's nowhere in our program where you have to say clear because you're allowed when we have more than one room, you're allowed to go back and forth to a room without saying clear in between and and work that those rooms until your time runs out or until like as an elite that you think that all you do, you found all the hides. So um, we don't require that you call clear at all. So in elite and elite only, we do require that you call finish because that level now has hides that are undisclosed to you. The judge in novice, advanced, superior and master will tell you exactly how many hides are in each level. But when you get to elite, they are not going to tell you. And there can be several hides in there or there can be one hide in there. It's up to the judge. So that's when we tell you that you have to call finish. And here's a tip. If you're running out of time and it's almost time and you don't think you found enough, it's, you got you know, five minutes and 58 seconds, just call finish because instead of just standing there, because maybe there's only the amount of hides that you had. So in that case, you'll at least get your, your leg counted for you. Um, and that's just a, a little a little thing. Another little tip, if you want to know, I probably shouldn't tell you this one, but I will. If you look at areas that are, uh, judges have set up for searches and they're areas that cannot be moved. So let's say we have trees and playground equipment and things like that. Um, think about where those things can be put. And our rules say once they're used, they can't be used again for the rest of the weekend. So just think about that and where a judge can place things in trial one on Saturday and trial two on Sunday. So just something for you to ponder on. All right. Um, I think I went over. Oh, so the aggressive responses, I'll tell you again a little bit more about that. So we don't, anything that's going to hurt the integrity of a hide, whether it's interior, exterior vehicles or master, it doesn't, I mean, yeah, vehicles or master, um, interior, exterior vehicles or containers it doesn't matter if the dog is going to do an aggressive alert, you're going to get a fault for it. Okay. The judges should be faulting you. So aggressive alerts include scratching, pawing, pushing, digging, biting for sure. Um, <clears throat> excessive licking, uh, a dog that leaves scratch marks on the object for sure. A dog that damages any object so that it has to be replaced. So if your dog is out there and it decides to uh, take a container and put it in his mouth and chuck it across the room, you're going to get faulted. That's an aggressive alert. Okay. So um, we want judges to understand that we want the dogs not to be doing that. So a lot of people are, um, and a lot of people have those games that they have for their dogs where they, they teach them to use their feet to get food out and all those things. Really not good for a nose work dog because now you're teaching them that using your feet to get what you want is acceptable. So if you are going to have a nose work dog, Probably not a good idea to use those kind of fun games with your dog because you are instilling in them that it's okay to use my feet to get what I want. Okay. 
So just something for you to think about. And we're not saying that the dog can't put his paw lightly on the box because it's adorable when the dogs, um, so a lot of the dogs we train are trained to lay their head on top of a box when it's, when they find it and to be stabilized there with it. So they'll put their two legs on the other side of the box and lay their head on top of it. That's not an aggressive alert. Okay. Putting their foot lightly on top of the box is not an aggressive alert. This and pushing it and pawing it and biting it and excessive licking of it, those are excessive alerts that you should get faulted for. Okay. So in, since we're talking about novice and, ad, and advanced, those alerts, um, again, should be a change of behavior that's recognized to the official, that communicates a decision, has been made on the part of the dog to the handler. It does not need to be on the entry form. Okay, so novice and advanced alerts do not be on the, need to be on the entry form at all. Um, superior alerts. Again, a formal and final response is not required at this level. Uh, it's not required for the dog to show a specific behavior. However, again, the change in behavior must be recognizable to the official and it must communicate a decision has been made on the part of the dog that, hey, here it is. Okay. It does not have to be on the entry form. However, in the superior class, the judge can ask you um, what your behavior is. You must be able to articulate three possible behaviors or chains of behaviors if you are asked by the judge what my dog does. So in the beginning of the class, before you start searching, if the judge says, hey, what is your alert behavior? You must be able to say, my dog stamps his feet, puts his nose on and wags his tail. So those are three particular things my dog does. Or I can say my dog does a sit or a down. Uh, Karen? And those are, yes. Uh, looks like Sarah has a question. It says, in novice, would continued sniffing at a spot be a change in behavior? Yes. I mean, if the dog is is totally focused on that, there's a gnat now. If that dog is totally focused on the box and sniffing, 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 absolutely. You know, we're, we're talking that's a definite change in behavior where they're not leaving. I'm talking about the dog goes and then just walks on, right? That's not what we, because that's that's a change in behavior, but that's just, hey, do I smell something? It's not, hey, here it is. Okay. So yeah, that would definitely do okay. So master, that's when you have to start stating your alerts on the entry form. Is barking and yes, barking is an acceptable change of behavior as long as the dog doesn't continuously bark through the whole thing all the time. So um, yeah, absolutely. So if your dog stands there and barks at something, that's definitely a change of behavior. Okay. Unless the dog barks, has barked from the time you started the run until the time you finish it. And then there isn't really a change in behavior. Well, maybe then it would be if he's quiet, right? If he goes to the box, he's barking all the time and he's quiet. That would be a change of behavior too. So yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, master alert behavior has to be stated on the entry form. It's the first time it has to be stated on the entry form and the score sheet. Up to three behaviors may be listed specific behaviors or a chain of behavior. So a specific behavior would be my dog sits. A chain of behavior would be my dog stamps his feet, puts his nose on and wags his tail. So that would be one set of behaviors. Okay. Um, so people sometimes get confused, but if your dog does all three of those. So when I started out with this, my sweet little Malinois Soleil, she had the coolest thing. And I let her, I learned, I let her do this. Um, I let her go on her own and she had the cutest a little alert. She would go and she would find it and she would stamp her two front feet down. She would point her nose on it and then she would stamp her two back feet and she would just wag her tail like this. And that was the coolest thing. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world until we got to Superior. That wasn't cool anymore because there was more than one hide. And then when we got to master, it was worse. And so um, I switched her behavior to a down, um, a down on low objects, and she can sit on high objects. And now we're very clear to communicate with each other. Okay. So um, one of those, one of the reasons I tell you that is a lot of times we've done, I've been through a lot of these things that have happened with our dogs and, and understand that it's much better in the higher levels to have something that's very defined for the dog. Okay. So. In master, the dog has to be exhibiting at least one of those. All right. So if you said my dog stamps his feet, puts his nose on there, wags his tail, then at least stamping his feet would be an acceptable one. Putting his nose on it would be acceptable or stopping at it and wagging his tail would be acceptable or the chain altogether or obviously the sit or the down would be acceptable. 
All right, in elite, that also has to be stated on the entry form and on the score sheet. The official may ask you for, for, for clarification on any of these, and no more than two behaviors can be listed. And the reason that we did that is because many dogs are trying to down on low hides and sit on high hides because they can't reach them, or it's easier for you, the dog, to point to it if it's in a sit than it is in a down if it's five feet high, okay? So that's the reason for that. The dog must be exhibiting at least one of the behaviors you put on there. So if I put sitter down and my dog does either, we're, we're golden. Okay. So now that you've gone through all those classes and you have your titles in, let's say, novice, the novice level, novice interior, exterior, vehicles, and containers. And you're like, okay, now what do I do, right? You can go right on into championship classes as long as you compete in the B classes. So, and you can enter as, like I said, as many of those as you want. So if someone's having a container trial and you're, uh, let's say they're having a full trial, um, you can enter all of those classes. You can enter um, containers in novice, advanced, superior, master, and elite. If you have those all titles, if you just have your novice title, then you can enter anything in novice B and anything in advanced A. Okay. Once you get your advanced title, you can enter anything in novice and advanced B and anything in superior A. So we go up as we build. So that gets a little confusing, but it's, it's not too bad once you understand that every time you get a new level, you can enter anything below it in the B class and that level and anything above it in the A class to still get your title. So once you have your title, you can work in those classes in the B level. And once you, if you don't have your title, you can work in those classes in the A level. Okay. So now we have level championships, okay? And once the dog has earned that novice nose work, he can begin to earn his novice championship. And then once they earn their novice championship, they can earn their novice grand championship. Now, like I said, you can enter any of them. So let's say you have an elite dog. You can go into any of those classes. The only problem is in the championship level, we have to, you have, we send the certificates in order. So let's say you happen to finish your advanced championship before your novice. You had, oh my gosh, I can't find a vehicle trial and I just need one vehicle leg to finish my novice championship. But um, I got my all my advanced legs somehow, right? Because your dog did it in advance and didn't and made a mistake in novice. So when you will hold your advanced title until you get that final leg in novice, and then you'll get both certificates. Okay. So in the championship level, we send them in order. However, we don't in the grand. So once, let's say you got your novice championship and your advanced championship and you earned your um, advanced grand championship, we're going to send it to you right away. You don't need the novice grand for us to send that to you. I know that's a little confusing, but that's, that's in our computer system. That's how we had to work it. All right. So once a dog has earned all five level championships, novice, advanced, superior, master, elite, they are then deemed an overall nose work champion. So those initials are NWCH, where like the novice is NNCH, advanced is ACH, and we had to use the double letters because we already had something else with those letters. And then same thing goes for the grand. So once you earn all of those level championships and you earn all of those, then you can be become a, a grand championship. So now we're getting handler discrimination. And handler discrimination is a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's super easy in the beginner levels. It's um, what I tell people to be really careful of is who you're training with, okay? So not that you can't train with anybody, that's not it. But if you're training with this particular person all the time, be careful that the dog doesn't also think that they have to ha find your friend's box too. Because if they're always putting out your glove, the dog is going to hit both odors. Okay. So if your friend's in the same trial and their glove happened to come first, your dog's going to hit that glove. And then you're going to NQ because they hit their glove instead of your glove. So just be careful that whoever's handling boxes and gloves, boxes included, that um, they're either not at the same trial with you or you're wearing gloves or you're doing something else to, to prevent the dog pairing your, your partner's odor with yours as well, because they'll do it. Okay, we had a lot of trouble with people in the beginning, and those were the main questions I asked. And they went, 
oh yeah, she always puts my box out. And I'm like, yeah, well, your dog just paired her odor with you. And she happened to be before hers in the trial and the dog hit the other odor. Um, so stuff like that does happen. Um, all right, so we have the new class for handler discrimination is master, okay? Our regular classes are the novice, advanced, and excellent. In novice, there's one glove, yours, in one box, yours, amongst the other 11 boxes that should only have basically the person's odor on that put the box out, okay? Because obviously there's going to be odors on those boxes, no matter how you try, there's still going to be human odor on the boxes. So um, it's just going to be your glove and you're going to drop it inside the box and they're going to take it and place it in the line with you not looking. And then the dog, you're going to turn around and ask the dog to search and find your box. Okay, again, at this level, novice, advanced, and excellent, there does not need to be a defined alert. The box will be closed, okay, in this level, so um, the dog cannot get the glove. Well, they can if they dig for it, but then you're in trouble that way, right? So we don't want the dog sticking their nose in the box and pulling the glove out and those kind of things. That would be deemed an aggressive alert. But the boxes are all closed in novice, advanced, and excellent, okay? So there's a novice level. 12 boxes in a, low, in a row. It looks just like the container trials. Oh, I forgot. I also forgot that we took out pre-trials. I forgot to tell you that one. Um, they're no longer applicable. So it looks just like a, a novice container search, the HD novice level. Okay. Except they're gloves instead. The um, advanced level, it's your glove. And then 11 others are scented by the same person. So either the steward or the judge scents the glove, puts it in the box. So you have your glove amongst 11 of the same odors of the other one. So the dog just has to discriminate you from the same other odor. Okay. And it should be fairly easy to jump to that level because he's used to smelling the odor of another person on the box, right? Because that person had to set the box out there. So it shouldn't be too hard to jump from novice to advanced. Then we have excellent. And there's, up to 12 different odors, depending on how many people are in the trial. So it's 12 handlers at a time. So it can be 12 different odors out there in the 12 different boxes, but no more than 12 boxes. Okay. So um, that's how that works. Uh, so then we have master. So master is a little bit of a different beast. Okay. And it's lots of fun. And even though people were very skeptical, they were like, oh, my dog's not going to be able to do that. They've had a blast with it. Okay. It's, it's gone over really, really well. So it has a specific set of rules. The dog has to have either a sit or a down. That's all it can do at the master level. The boxes are open. They are not closed. And it's a personal item. So it doesn't have to be a glove. It can't be a glove. It's a personal item. Okay. So, um, the boxes are, the, the handlers can see the boxes. So this is another thing that we're, um, that's going to be in the rules for 2021 that we didn't put in. And what happens with master is your armband number is on the outside of your box. Okay. So the judge doesn't miss where they, you know, where it is and they know where it is. And they put your armband on the outside of the box. You come put your personal item in the box and they set them out in a random pattern in the ring. Okay. There's a specific area that you and the dog come to before you start searching in that ring. All of the other handlers in this class can watch. They can watch the whole thing. The thing of it is, is what we don't want to happen is we don't want the judge in um, before the class in the familiarization to take all the handlers and say, okay, your box is there. Your box is there. That's not what we meant for it to do. So, We've told the judges that's not what we mean for them to do. So we don't want you to, to know exactly where your box is. If you happen to be able to see it, okay, that's fine. But you're not supposed to be directing your dog to it anyway. So there's no reason for the judge to say, oh, your box is right here and your box is over there and your box is right here. Not, not what we wanted for that. So the other thing that when you enter the ring and you have your dog in the specific place for them to search, once you send the dog, you can't use like a hand motion to say, okay, here's my box. I can just send them right here. You can, you know, lose, you use your hand motion like this, but there's no specific, you cannot use a specific point like they do in directed retrieves and things because we don't want you to direct your dog to the box. It's his job or her job to find your, your 
personal item out there. Once you send the dog, you need to be quiet in the box. So there's no talking. There's no moving around. There's no, oh, hey, oh. you know, like this, right? Just try to show your dog is over here. No, okay? You're going to get faulted for that, all right? The, it's the dog, remember, it's the dog's job, not your job, to find your item out there, okay? So you're supposed to be quiet in there. So not, you know, dancing around, not moving back and forth, quiet in there, and not that you can't give them additional commands while they're, while they're searching. If your dog is having a problem and they get like a little, you know, a little, I call it begelchter. It's my, it's my makeup word, right? They get a little begelchter out there. Um, you can call them back and reset them and resend them. So once the dog finds your box, it needs to lie down or sit at that box and hold that position. The judge is going to do a count. The dog has to stay there for the count after you've set elite or alert elite. So your dog is going to go to the box, gets the right one, does his behavior. You say alert. Your time stops right there. That's your search time. It doesn't keep going because that wouldn't be fair. In case your dog changes a position, you're allowed one change of position for the dog, but he has to correct himself. If he stays in that position, you're fine. Okay. So let's say down. And the judge starts counting three, two, and the dog sits. Okay, you're going to get a fault for that, but you're not going to, if the dog stays there, you're going to be okay. All right, if he lays down again, that's a second change of position and it's an NQ. All right, so you're fine. Dog stays there for your three seconds. You call the dog back to you. At that point, you can give them your treat, your reward, your play toy, whatever. Um, you just can't get crazy enough to where, you know, you can't throw the toy, you can't throw the food, those kind of things. And then the dog comes back to you and you leave the ring and, hey, yippee skippy, you did a great job. So that's what that is meant for. And it mimics a lot of um, real world situations for detection dogs and what they're expected to do. Okay. So it is a higher level advanced class. It, it is it is not out there for everyone. If you don't want to do it, we're okay with it. But we're hoping that it helps people train their dog for a little bit more directable or a little bit more um, reliable uh, alert behaviors. Because if I'm in handler discrimination and I know I have to do it in master, I'm probably going to start doing it in novice, okay, which is a really good thing. So we're, um, in my idea, it was helping people uh, train their dogs um, to a little bit higher level to achieve that. And we only put it in handler discrimination. So it's only in there. That's the only place we say the dog has to do this. Okay. It's awesome. It's kind of like getting an OTS, right? The high level class. Okay. So now we have some other new titles for handler discrimination. Um, we have uh, titles of distinction, they're called. Okay. So once a dog earns its excellent handler discrimination title, or the master handler discrimination title, they can begin earning titles for the excellent handler discrimination supreme. Yay! They have to earn 10 legs from the excellent class for each title. Okay. And that will give them the designation of excellent handler discrimination supreme. So if you get 10 legs, you get that title. You get It's kind of like rally. You know, 10 more legs, you get a EHDS2. And then 10 more legs, you get an EHDS3. Um, we also do that for the master class. So that you get a master handle discrimination excellent title. That's the MHDX. So first 10 legs for that. Second 10 legs, MHDX2, MHDX3. Okay. Once your dog has earned the master title, then you can start earning legs toward the champion title. So you see, you can get excellent um, EHDS legs without having the master title okay so if you just want to go to excellent we're still going to let you have that excellent hd title okay that um and you can keep earning that so once you get a master title then you can start earning championship legs as well so we have a master discrimination champion and those are combined wins again very similar to rally at 10 different ukc licensed handler discrimination trials you have to earn 10 qualifying searches in each handler discrimination, excellent B and master B at the same trial. 
the score doesn't matter. The time doesn't matter um, because obviously we don't have a score, but the time doesn't matter. As long as you are qualifying, your leg will count for that trial. Um, and you have to earn 10 combined ones in both Master B and Excellent B. And once you get your 10, then you're going to be deemed a handler discrimination champion. From there, again, if you get combined wins, if you keep going, 15 additional combined wins will give you the handler discrimination grand champion. Okay. So it's very similar to how the rally program is set up as far as that goes, where you're doing um, combined wins and things like that. All right. I am so excited that you all came here. And as always, you can always contact me anytime at UKC. Um, don't, you know, anytime you want to contact me, send me an email, give me a call. I'm always there for you to answer questions. And I love that y'all were here today. And I hope you have fun in some other sessions today.